Hello, I'm Mitch Stargrove, and I'm here with our first presentation. This is Manifesting Ma'at, Creating Healthy Futures in Alignment with Gaia. So as we present today's features, we're going to be looking at Ma'at in terms of being a Netaru, a deity, in terms of being the way the universe and life are organized and operate, and third, in how Ma'at is a way of living. So I'm going to be introducing some notions about Ma'at from ancient Kem. Then we'll be looking at some models of metahistory in which we see where a mythology about the Aeon of the Daughter appears and how Ma'at may relate to that storyline or those many storylines. And then we'll look at how Ma'at has meaning in our lives. We all know that Ma'at has something to do with ancient Egypt, with the land called Kem, the Black Lands along the Nile River. And Ma'at may bring to mind a few images, one of which is an ostrich feather, a white plume, and the other is the image rendered in many places over a long period of time of the scales, an image wherein we see a heart on one side and the feather of Ma'at on the other side. And we see Anubis or Anpu. They're measuring the balance between those two. And the person whose heart it is has recently died and their heart is being weighed against a feather to see if it's light as a feather whether that's the weight or maybe the contents. If one's heart is full of light, it will be as light as a feather. Ma'at is a personification of natural law, of truth and justice. Ma'at is created each day by living in respectful relationships. She is the feather against which your heart is measured when you die. The pharaoh and all social structures in ancient Egypt derived their authority from serving Ma'at. Sekhmet is the protector of Ma'at. In fact, the very foundation of the society is the foundation stone of Ma'at. And all the power that those in authority claim only come from their serving Ma'at. Sekhmet is the one who helps restore balance, who brings the power of life in to serve Ma'at. Two places we see Ma'at mentioned often and there aren't that many places where we can find Ma'at, because as far as I know, there are no Ma'at temples. There are temples for other Netaru, but Ma'at is all pervasive. So maybe that's why she's in every temple, but has none of her own. If there is, let me know. So two things we know about Ma'at are the 42 negative confessions and the seven cardinal virtues. So the negative confessions are statements of things that one has not done during the life that you have lived. And these are asked at the time of the weighing of the heart. And these are statements about being a virtuous, compassionate person in yourself and in your relationships. The seven cardinal virtues we see, truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, order. So these are really... Uh, guidelines. They're some of the first sets of writings in the West on what we would call right and wrong. And they are principles that will appear later on. Many will claim the Ten Commandments are based on these articulations. Um, but those seven cardinal virtues, one thing that is interesting is that all of these categories can be and are translated in sacred texts as ma'at. So I'm going to show you here some material on the history of Ma'at in Kem. Um, there's more detail here than we're going to look at fully, but things are highlighted and please read them later on. The PDF is readily available. Putting together this material, one source I relied on a lot is Malana Karinga. He is a modern neo-Kemite. 
He's coming from African traditions and African culture and seeing an extension of ancient Chem in these cultures. Um, in, in the Neo-Chemite literature, uh, there's a strong emphasis on Ma'at as central to social organization and everyday behavior. So Ma'atian ethics uh, first emerged around 4,000 to 3,500 BCE. This is the time when the upper and lower kingdoms were united, where we see the emergence of a unified state. And with that, all the trappings uh, of authority and institution and legitimacy. The Shabaka text uh, is part of the, what's called the Memphite theology. This uh, culture is centered in the city of Memphis. Uh, and we'll see these are primary documents, particularly in the Old Kingdom. The Sebayat, uh, of which the, the Sebayat are a set of literature, the first and most important being the instructions of the Prime Minister. Because again, this is moral behavior that is supposed to be part of the system from the top down and from the down up. The oldest complete book of the instructions is by Ptah Hotep. He is the vizier or prime minister of King Issei, about 2300 BCE. This becomes the model for all the other Sebat documents later. For Ptah Hotep, then Ma'at is not only morally right, it is effective, it works and yields benefit. Here, social welfare is a fundamental and continuing component of Ma'at. The living of Ma'at presupposes and necessitates a learning of Ma'at. And in the Sabbat, learning is a fundamental virtue. At all times, was inspired by the optimistic belief in the teachability of man. Ma'at is present at creation. Ma'at is order as in natural order, as in the process of emergence, uh, the essence of existence. So, Coming directly out of creation, Ma'at is inherently healthy and well-proportioned, dynamic in its relationships. When Ma'at isn't taken care of through our direct action internally and in relationship, what emerges is called isfit. This is untruth, falsehood, disorder, sometimes called chaos. Uh, and this is really a product of our neglect as human beings. When we live in Ma'at and restore and create Ma'at each day, then that becomes the default of our relations. The Shabaka text is considered the earliest known discussion of right and wrong in the history of man. Uh, this again is part of the Memphite theology and we see this about the fourth millennium BCE centered around Memphis. Uh, in that time, Ptah, Sekhmet, and Nefertum were primary focuses of the religious and political institutions. Central to the ethical corpus of the Matian literature is this set of instructions. And this is used again and built upon throughout the system so that the system was supposed to be based on principles of justice. Now, Karenga talks about Matian philosophical anthropology, and there's a few points here that are really valuable in restructuring our view of humanity and what Ma'at means. Humans are in the image of God. So what this really means is that humanity is an expression of Ra, of the sun itself, of the life source. And as such, we as humans are essentially good being in the likeness of deity. So when this is the way life comes about, there is no need for one to become transformed through some external experience or authority. You don't need to be converted, saved, experience moksha, be redeemed, because in fact, you are already in the image of God and your imperative is to manifest that imperative for perfectibility. This view of the world stands in stark contrast to many of the doctrines we see coming out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, or even some might say characteristic of the age of Osiris or the Piscean age. Ma'at, the self-actualization of humans, is only achieved in relation with others. So Ma'at is a social and a personal task uh, it's a living practice. Uh, 
not just a set of ethics about contemplation and personal ethics, but about the imperative to create and maintain just society. So this, this back and forth between the ideal and the practical is central to Ma'at. And relationships are the particular context in which humans realize themselves and assist others in self-realization and growth. Here we see two principles, service, wenut, and love, merut. So in actualizing ourselves, our nature is to work with others in their self-realization and growth. The I and the we aligning here. So this element of, of service and love is key. And in all behavior, this is described as a path of life. So just to reiterate, two key points. First is the assumption of a shared nature with deity ontologically and morally through Ma'at. And in this is the ontological potential of perfectibility for the human person through the pursuit of fundamental values. Second is that cultivation through righteous behavior is the ultimate goal and therefore is achieved in relation with others. That is to say one becomes a person in community. Now in being this person in community, we are acting in the role of the cultivated human. And in this system, this is called the Geruma. This is the person who is self-mastered, whose whole character is infused with Ma'at. The two words involved are Geru, which means silent, self-mastered, self-controlled, and Ma, true, righteous. So this person is a cultivated being who's realized themselves. As such, this is the exemplar of the human, and in fact considered to be our default evolutionary path with cultivation, and healthy relationship. In this beautiful picture on the right, we see Seshet with her beautiful galactic antennae, and we see Tahuti there, the two that bring wisdom, that help articulate it, and it looks like we may have a sycamore tree there in the middle. The best and shortest road toward knowledge of truth is nature. That proverb really shows us how what we consider in modern language uh, nature, I doubt this is an accurate translation actually, but what we consider nature with a capital N is really how Ma'at expresses itself, particularly in the world that we live in. And that in living in this world, observing how nature works shows us how we can live best. In looking at how humans can live self-realized in community, one question arises is that of the fall. Uh, the mythology that humanity somehow has suffered from its bad choices. Some might say fell, some might say jumped from its choices to go into experience of duality. And with it, duality is a fall in which the material plane is somehow lesser than or even evil in relationship to the more exalted subtle planes. This bifurcation has really contributed to our necessity to recover from a lot of collective trauma and to learn what we can from the world we have created to bring forth a healthy future. We have here a drawing from Pierre Tirehard de Chardin that shows a process of archaic humans going through a process of separation from nature and then a shift point and then a reintegration with nature. And as we know, these two factors are moving and are occurring in different places at different rates and at different phases. But this movement toward a global culture with its diversity and with its practice of respect, we see the emergence of a new culture in alignment with Gaia. So I'm going to show you a few models and see how those relate to Ma'at, and then we'll see what we can do with those models. Sri Aurobindo, known for radiating, for meditating, for writing poetry and profound essays, 
he is someone in the early and mid 20th century who is bringing forth a vision of humanity evolving. In fact, talking about how mutation within the cells can be part of that plan. If there is to be a future, it will wear the crown of feminine design. Aurobindo was in many ways a parallel of Mahatma Gandhi in India. This is Jean Gebser. He lived in Switzerland. He was a historian, philosopher, poet, writer. He sketched out over many years a map of humanity's evolution in which we see an unfolding of culture into new levels, moving from the local to the regional to the global. And he lays out in this scheme how language and communication, the form of thinking, and the cultural socioeconomic structures all reflect these different stages. He introduced, along with Aurobindo, who were in communication and collaboration, uh, the use of the word integral. This has later been used by William Irwin Thompson in his very accessible renditions of Gebser and by uh, Ken Wilber. Gebser said, Origin is ever present. It is not a beginning, since all beginning is bound to time, and the present is not the mere now, today, or the moment. It is not a time division, rather an achievement of wholeness, and this always original. Whoever is able to bring to effectiveness and reality the wholeness of origin and the present to make it concrete, as opposed to it remaining abstract, he overcomes beginnings and ends and the mere current time. The ever-present origin is one of his major works. For all the stars flow through your veins. Another individual in the mid-20th century who was talking about these types of concepts is a Jesuit priest named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He spoke of human evolution moving toward a place called the Omega Point at which humanity will have matured. He named the structure that was emerging through humanity's global presence as the noosphere. Quote, Today, something is happening to the whole structure of human consciousness. A fresh kind of life is starting. Driven by the forces of love, the fragments of the world are seeking each other so that the world may come into being. And here's a map from one of his books, The Phenomenon of Man. And it shows this uh, increasing complexity of life through history, the emergence of consciousness. And then we see humanity reaching a point where it can sink into collapse and dispersion or love energy, what he calls the unifying force of love energy, will enable human planetization and a convergence to omega in what he calls a mega synthesis. When we look at history, we hear of a time where individuals rose from their groups and became fully actualized, aware present, these individuals, Jesus, Lao Tzu, Buddha, others, arose from the group as individuated awarenesses embodied, and they were pioneers of human evolution. Over time, more and more individuals have become aware and embodied. And what we are seeing now is if there's going to be a time of great transformation, the old model of the individual who's the messiah or the guru is no longer going to be the form of human change. Instead, you and your friends are the gurus. Community is the form. Collectivity is the plane of new humanity emerging. Thich Nhat Hanh, a Theravanan Buddhist from Vietnam, said, the next Buddha will not take the form of an individual. The next Buddha may take the form of a community, a community practicing understanding and loving kindness, a community practicing mindful living. This may be the most important thing we can do for the survival of the earth. So those are some views of meta history from various angles. One could also look at Rudolf Steiner and his foretelling of a time of the age of Sophia, 
who he subtitles the new Isis with a an N-U. And we can find these stories in many other places in the Western Hemisphere, Mayan, Aztec, Incan prophecies. We can find many versions of this story of humanity coming of age. But what we're going to look here now is a particular set of places where Ma'at is brought into this story of meta-history. When one hears the word aeon, or an aeon of somebody, probably the first instance one might remember about this is a fellow named Aleister Crowley. In his system called Thelema, he declared that the aeon of Horus began in 1904. And my understanding is that he underwent a process that others have participated in in different times of what does one see on the subtle planes at the dawn of spring of each year. And for an extended period of time, possibly 2,000 years, at dawn on spring equinox of the new year, what we see in the horizon is the god Osiris. And this story is based on the notion that in 1904 there was a changing of the gods and that on the spring equinox Horus appeared in his throne on the eastern horizon. Nice image. 1904. If we think about 1904 and the 20th century we see a, a big shift in humanity's behavior and relationship to the planet. Uh, noticeably, in 1905, Einstein published a key paper describing the interchangeable aspect of mass and energy. We're starting to see how Kether is in Malkuth and Malkuth in Kether. Air flight, hawk, Horus, flying rockets, electronic media, nuclear technologies, global movement, the dissolution of old cultures and the reemergence of something yet unknown. Alongside deriving from and sometimes moving beyond the standard model of Orthodox Thelema, we see some other storylines. And these are all people that I came to know in the 1980s, and many have been long term cohorts. The Horace Mont Lodge. HML, the Ordo Adeptorum Invisiblum, the OAI, and the British Journal of Ma'at People in England. We have many communities of practice that have created their own understandings of this magical tradition that have been transmuting it, carrying it forward. And we're going to look at some of their storylines, particularly the uh, storyline about the Aeon of Ma'at and or the Aeon of the Daughter. In 1904, with his partner Rose, Alistair Crowley in Cairo made contact with some non-human entity, and a text was dictated over the course of three days. When this text was first named, uh, the name was Liber L, with a single letter L. Later, we will see the name changed to Liber A.L., Liber al Velegus, the Book of the Law. This is the central text in the lineage of Thelema as expressed in the OTO and other places. Here we see Crowley in his ceremonial garb, standing next to his magician table with tools and a steli of revealing, a document that triggered his encounter with this non-human entity who spoke with him and Rose the three days. This doctrine proclaiming the advent of the Aeon of Horus contained some riddles that Crowley didn't quite know what to do with. In fact, over time, he, he wasn't always sure about how happy he was being the prophet of the new Aeon of Horus. And in his notes... He contemplated some of the questions that arose within the original text. In particular, one part of the Book of the Law declares that the prophet shall not know the full secret of this book, and one other shall follow. 
With this in mind, Crowley started thinking about what might appear. In discussing the Aeon of Horus, he said, His formula is not yet fully understood. Following him will arise the equinox of Ma, the goddess of truth. It may be a hundred or ten thousand years from now, for the computation of time is not here as there. So he's saying in 1904, the Aeon of Horus is starting, and he's acting under this relatively mechanistic 2,000-year formula, at least sometimes. What appears, however, is a prophecy of the Aeon of Ma'at. Crowley was in consternation and intrigued about this remark that someone else might have the answer he would want to understand this prophecy. He set out to look among his students and his magical circles, and someone appeared, someone who would prophesy that the Aeon of Mott would begin in 1947. And the essence of this teaching was revealed through Aleph Lamed, A-L. Aleph, the first breath, the opening from Kether, the connecting in trust, stepping forth like the fool. And we see there the lotus with the Aleph and the babe with his finger over his mouth. And likewise, we see in the lower right the form of Horus as the hawk, the falcon, and we see Horus, the child, with finger over his mouth. Horpocrat, Harpocrates. On the left, Harpo, maybe the avatar of Harpocrat. This is the draft of the Fool card done by Lady Frida Harris as she and Aleister Crowley were designing the Thoth deck. Lamed, there's the character Lamed below a picture of Ma'at, a relief from a wall in Egypt, and we can see there her feather. And there we see the adjustment card done by F Lady Frida Harris and Aleister Crowley, and the emphasis on the scales and their dynamic equilibrium above and below in their movement. Aleph Lamed, that's all we need from the Book of the Law. But who came with that message? Charles Stansfield Jones appeared in Crowley's circle. He became Frater Akkad. One of his magical numbers was 777. 111 past 666, 111 being Aleph the Fool. We can see his Laman in the upper left with the name Parsifal, his magical name, his motto, the 777 and the 418 in the middle, A-L as part of Parsifal. Below we see the pentagram of Ma Eon, the Aeon of Ma, and this is used by Frater Akkad in his later work. Akkad offers this, the simple model that following the Aeon of Horus would be the Aeon of Maat. But we're not waiting 2,000 years. We're waiting till 1947, April 2nd. Maat reappears in the 1970s as a focus of priestly and prophetic practice. In Ohio, Maggie Crosby, later Maggie Engels, known as Andahadna, later Nima, connected with the being identified as Ma'at, and transmitted a text called Liber Penai Prinumbra, the book of the pre-shadowing of the feather. This is 1974. On the left, we see Nima on the cover of the Cincinnati Journal of Ceremonial Magic, a publication of numerous issues put together in fine quality with a diverse set of authors and contributors coming out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And this is the place where we see Liber Penai Prenumba first published. Above, we see a picture of Ma'at in the center with various related figures. And on the right, we see an image of Natan. This is drawn by Nima. Natan is a being encountered by many in the Horus Ma'at Lodge. On one side, Natan is every individual being and their associated star. Every man and every woman is a star. And on the left is a single being, the wholeness of collective humanity, self-aware as a single being. 
Naton is our access point to the future self of humanity in its healthy state. The evolutionary future of humanity in the model of the Horus Mott Lodge is called Homo Veritas, true human. And as humanity evolves, this is the form built into our very structures and ready for realization. Central to this work in practice is self-initiation. Simple tools, the mirror, the feather, the candle. Ma'at is made accessible to everyone with no need for an order, an instruction, a transmission by anyone else. In the upper right is a seal of Ipsos, a key word in the Horus Mott Lodge lineage, and this is the term that translates as from the same mouth. It has many pronunciations and applications. We also see here the seal of the Horus Mott Lodge, the feather on the red triangle. In the center, we see a painting by Nima of infinity held within a lotus. Within the system of Nima and the Horus Mott Lodge, what is set up is a six-part aeonic system, and it's laid out here. Basically, we have a beginning, a four stages, and an ending, and each one of them has a uh, an aeon name, a social type, a god form, a tool, a magical act, symbol, and various practices. In this system, as you'll see, the father, mother, son, daughter model is present, and Horus is the son, and Ma'at the daughter, and each of these systems corresponds to a set of practices. The point of this as a tool of understanding is that when we're in the center, we access all of the aeons and the past and the future. So that being in that center, we belong to none of these systems, but we can access all of them and use what they have to bring us. As you may have noticed, some of these aeonic themes are described using the wording of a family motif and aligning that with a tree of life from the Kabbalistic traditions. So there's an image of that tree in red. What we see on the left are five of the Sephiroth involved in this formula. Um, at the top, Kether, Unity. At the bottom, Malkuth, the earth plane manifestation. We see the father and the mother, and we see the son, each of those in their position, and each of those having some kind of role in the wholeness. Again, this is based on the notion and variance of this tree of life structure on the fall, that heaven and earth used to be in the same place, and now they've separated. So the model then implies a need to restore. So if we're looking at the Horus Mott Lodge notion of meta-history, uh, one conclusion and a commonly stated declaration is that we are creating or connecting with the Aeon of Ma'at. And oftentimes that Aeon of Ma'at is postulated to be in the future and we have access to that future. I want us to look at a few other angles on that model and how they might apply to these characters. If Horus is individuated consciousness, the sun, how does the sun embody in Malkuth? Well, the name Hathor means house of Horus. That takes us a long way, doesn't it? We have the female solar embodiment principle with a face the goddess of love and pleasure there in the center with her solar crown, her horns. We see on the left the relationship between Hathor and Nuit. Nuit, the star goddess, the home of each of us as a star being. And there we see the connection of Hathor being the localization of Nuit. Beautiful picture on the ceiling and Dendera, wonderful place to lay and enter cosmic space and time. On the right, we see a picture also from Dendra of Hathor with her own female falcon on her head, holding the Ankh and the Waz. 
So Hathor is a pretty good candidate for Malkuth, for the daughter. Now, another approach is using the Age of Aquarius model. Um, so within this, uh, a theory is that every 2,000 years, there's a dominant storyline, and that is articulated by the signs of the zodiac and implied in that with each sign is its opposite sign. And this is associated with the phenomenon that there's a slight shift each year between the zodiacal position objectively and subjectively. Within this system of 2,000 year segments, roughly, what we've seen is the pattern of Pisces in the heavens and Virgo on the earth. We know what that's been like. The Aeon of Osiris, some would say. What we see in that process moving forward is the time of the age of Aquarius, much vaunted, much awaited. And what sign is opposite Aquarius? It's Leo. So if we have Aquarius as the hawk in the sky, Aquarius being an air sign, and Aquarius dealing with human liberation and visionary potential in humanity. Then what's opposite? How is that applied on Earth? Leo in the feminine. Well, look at those nice two there. We've got Aquarius with the hawk, and we have Leo the lioness, Sekhmet. This might indicate that, again, the solar feminine in Egyptian mythology, one key form is Sekhmet. So Sekhmet could be the daughter. Both of these characters, Sekhmet and Ba'ast, are considered the female son embodied. We see on the left a picture from Cairo outside the old National Museum, where a Sekhmet statue has two cats. And we see on the right the picture of Sekhmet from Abydos, the temple of Seti I, and there she has her solar crown. In overview, if we're looking at the notion of Horus being the sun, and who would his consort be or his other manifestation form, would be one of these solar feminine goddess Sekhmet, Bast, Hathor. In all of these storylines, we see some variation of the aeon of the child, of humanity growing up. If we're all children of the gods, what will happen when we grow up? Will we not also be gods? In this mythology of Sekhmet, we do see the presence of Nefertem. There on the left, we see her son Nefertem, Sekhmet, giving him the keys to life. He is the blue lotus, actually a lily. He is the perfected being. He is the embodiment of Ma'at. And there in the bottom, we see you all celebrating with a little blue lotus drink. Probably some kind of entheogen, intoxicant, altered state, and experiential ceremonial usage. On the right, we see a curious picture. Might bring it all together. We see Sekhmet with Harpocrat, nursing Harpocrat, from Elephantine Island. The Aeon of the Child means the embodiment of Ma'at. Kether is in Malkuth, we just forgot. We are experiencing the restoration from the illusion of separation. There's no need for redemption. Life was perfectible in the first place. We're moving into post-binary perceptions and spectral embodiment, overcoming the false duality that heaven and earth are separate especially that they are in an antagonistic relationship. If the daughter in Malkuth comes forth, she will come in the 10,000 forms, as each is true to itself. As the daughter expresses itself in Malkuth, what we see is the 10,000 forms recover their divinity. See, each is true to itself. There is no separation. Malkuth is divine. One form where we can see this is Hathor, the house of Horus, the embodiment of consciousness, the love, the sensuality, the music, the dance, the ecstasy, 
So in this Neo-Egyptian approach to describing this historical pattern, the Anna of the daughter could be characterized as Hathor or Sekhmet, but the key is solar feminine embodied awareness. As we reunite heaven and earth, we reveal ourselves as the star children of Gaia. When I look at these various models, what I see from a perspective of meta-history is a set of themes that coalesce in a pattern that we'll see here. Initially, humans identify themselves as part of nature, of a place, of the locale in which they live. This they call the land. Humans organize and identify themselves as members of a band, a clan, a tribe, each wearing the mask of the roles they play. These are the people. Over time, individuals emerge from the group as exemplars of individuated consciousness. The I steps forth, the sun, the bright one. Consciousness among humans flourishes as we apply it in our lives. And over time, more and more humans identify as embodied individuated consciousness in alignment with this planet. We see the flowering of Gaia, the daughter, the return, the time of healing. And yet, we are all of these. We are connected to the land of our blood and our bones, of the place where we live. We are part of the we at many levels. Each of us is an I, the one behind the masks, the true self, the center of our own solar systems, bold as a sun, humble as a star. Over time, more and more individuals evolve. They become embodied, individuated consciousness, the line with this planet. We see the flowering of Gaia. The daughter has arrived. Each of these occurs simultaneously. We can step into each. We can be above and include each. So at that point, we're identifying integrally. We're recognizing ourselves and we recognize our relationships and to know that we are whole in relationship. Layers of existence. Does Ma'at fit into a model of time as we think of it historically? I really see that what we come to with Ma'at is an element of timelessness. Ma'at is not just in the future. Ma'at didn't just start in 1947. Ma'at is ever-present. And when we access that presence, we can access the past, the present, the future. Hence, when we connect with the future aeons, Ma'at is our connection pathway. She isn't necessarily the future. She is how we connect with the future. So here, Ma'at is, as she has been known throughout time, timeless. She is an eternal presence. She opens into all aeons, subjective and objective, mythic and historical. When we connect with the future ones, we pass through Ma'at as a trans-dimensional gateway. She is no more the future than she is the past. Ma'at can be elusive, more of a verb than a noun, not a thing within the system or even the system itself, but the dynamic equilibrating being of becoming. Ma'at can feel like a hummingbird beyond space and time, the still point ever moving, equilibrating in infinite planes through networks of relationships, dynamic and polyvalent, pervasive and ever present. She is the coherent self-organizing activity of living beings interrelating within layers of ecosystems across time. Ma'at interconnects all times as places, transcends and interpenetrates all aeons, historically, temporally, and perceptually. Ma'at is always here and now, within, between, and among, each and all. Living in Ma'at, one accesses the me, the I, and the we, aligned in all levels of organization, rooting in the past, connecting with the future, and manifesting in the here and now. The aeon of the daughter arrives in our lives when we embody ourself in awareness in the dynamic equilibrium of respectful interdependent relationships through time. 
why would we expect the manifestation of Malkuth to appear in any single fixed form? Malkuth is characterized by variety, by diversity, by manifestation. Each of these is Ma'at. Each of these is the daughter expressing itself through time in each place, through each of us. She comes in the glorious expression of the 10,000 things. We are Gaia, aligning the me, the I, the we, the bioregion in which we live, Gaia, the galactic spheres. Here, the Leo access theme appears as the creative individual thrives in place and community. Once identified by ancestry of blood and bone in a local bioregion as the people and the land, we are maturing into homo veritas, true human, within Gaia, connecting earth and starry heaven ancestors and future selves. This piece of art is called the Alchemical Dance of Natan and Gaia, for the waters, the airs, the soil, the fire, and Fukushima. Sean Woodward put it together after we related to him a working we are engaged in, where humanity as Natan arose at the scale of Gaia in a one-to-one -one relationship to transmute Fukushima from disaster to opportunity through alchemy. How do we live, Ma'at? What do these prophecies mean and these principles provide us with for living on a daily basis? Ma'at is eminently ideal and wholly practical. Embodiment, process, becoming, being, together. Mahatma Gandhi said in many places a, a phrase essentially, you never have ends, you only have means. And this is about the alignment between our methods and our goals and how we never actually have the goals. All we have is the becoming, the engagement, the creating. Emma Goldman, there is no greater fallacy than the belief that aims and purposes are one thing, while methods and tactics are another. This conception is a potent menace to social regeneration. All human experience teaches that the methods and means cannot be separated from the ultimate aim, the means employed become, through individual habit and social practice, part and parcel of the final purpose. They influence it, modify it, and presently the aims and the means become identical. If heaven and earth are reuniting, we have to ask, how were they ever separated? Maybe they weren't. When we look at the mythology of many societies, we see a recurrent figure of the tree of life. And here we see humanity, arms above, connecting with the heavens, the starry sky, the realm of energy, the unformed, the no thing. And below, connecting by roots to matter, to mother, to the past. And in the center, we see the realm of relationships, where communication, information, interaction create patterns of relationship. This is the full human. Here's a beautiful picture from Dion Fortune of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And I always love this picture because it shows that the Tree of Life is not out there. It is us standing with our heads in the heavens and our feet on the earth, and each part of our body associates with some aspect of the tree. Again, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. The sphere is the expression of the aperspectival world. Aperspectivity is the variation the awaring in truth of the whole and consequently of its spiritual manifestation, the diaphanon, inasmuch as the whole is perceptible only as a transparency wherein origin, also containing the entire future, is time-free present. To attain this consciously without abandoning the earlier consciousness structures is to overcome rationality in favor of irrationality and to break forth from mentality into diaphaneity. 
So if humans are made and all living systems are made as spheres, really these living spheres come in the form of a torus. They have a toroidal pattern of activity. We see space, the future above, time, past, below, and the directional orientation as life flows through wherever you are. Each being, this focus of life moving through. And intriguingly, in the center of the Taurus is emptiness. Here in the center now. So we're the center of this electromagnetic living whirling donut. And we are heaven, human, and earth and the center. Descending from heaven, ascending from matter, organizing from the center. Moving all together. But in real life, we don't see these lines we experience the totality. Even the Earth has a toroid structure magnetically. Interestingly, when we look at the torus from above, we see the classic symbol of the Sun, the point and the circumference together. Concentric circles have been used as images for humanity's relationship to the universe for a long time. When we look at it in terms of modern biology and ecosystems, we see that there are really many ways in which we can identify ourselves. There's sort of layers of nested systems of organization within living organisms. So we go from the level of the molecules to the crystalline matrix to the cells, the psychosomatic network, the organs, the body systems, the metasystems of the physiology of each being, and the somatic field. Here, really, this is what we tend to think of as the individual, the body-mind being, localized, embodied. This is one way we would say I, sort of into that aspect. But around, we're equally identified with our family, with our community, in the model of modern biology and ecosystems, we can look at the nested systems that exhibit themselves in the language of systems theory, ecology, and biology. We can see that each living being is organized in nested systems. These living spheres show that we live on many domains, and we could call each one of these a level of who am I? So we've got the molecules, the crystalline matrix, the cells, the psychosomatic network, the organs and their relationships, the body systems, the metasystems, the somatic field. This is really the, the thing we would usually call the me, the I, the body, the who am I in this experience of life. But beyond that, likewise, we have our circle of intimates, our family, our clan, our community. We have the place in which we live. We have the relationships in the place where we live, and we have the planet and all of the forms of life within. So each of these are layers in which we could identify and how we expand and contract that sense of who we are. Human perception changed in 1972. People born before that have to learn about Gaia. Everyone born after that, it's part of your hardwiring now. This is the time when, from the point of view of Apollo 7, humanity first saw a picture of the Earth in full view. This comes from December 7, 1972. This is the emergence in collective consciousness of an understanding and an experience of the Earth as a single being. One of the individuals there, Edgar Mitchell, said, You develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. 
Umberto Maturana is one of the developers of modern complexity theory, particularly looking in biology at what's called autopoiesis, a self-creating process. The acceptance of other things among us in coexistence is the biological foundation of the social phenomenon. Without love, without acceptance of the other with us, there is no socialization, and without this there is no humanity. I am, you are, we are, Gaia healing. A statement, being strong, self-knowing, being in community, creating a healthy planet together. A mantra we can all live with and often executed in dance and song. So what does Mott mean in our lives? We can access our future selves. We can talk to our ancestors. If we are across time, it's really the same. When we talk with our ancestors, who are they talking with? Their future ones. When someone from the future connects with us, we're the ancestors. So we're in all these places. When we have a question to ask, an uncertainty, a pathway to discover, ask your future self, how did you get to that healthy future? In practice, healing is the operational force of life, and ma'at is the mechanism by which bodies, living systems, equilibrate, act in relationship, express their health. Medicine is the practice of supporting healing. Tahuti embodies the intervention of the physician. Sekhmet embodies the power of self-healing. When we live in a respectful way within ourselves and in our relationship, we are in alignment with our will, our true self. Knowing ourselves, star, heart, belly, root, connecting when we live from the perspective of the creative self as a healthy ego balanced in its solar system, we don't need to get stuck in the masks of personae. We can dance a mask, we can take it off, we can change, and sometimes we can simply be ourselves knowing that we are not those masks and making sure as best we can to communicate self to self. That is respect. To be healthy within a living system, we first want to reduce the noise, the things we create by our bad habits, by our not paying attention, by keeping too busy. And we want to be able to really feel and sense the signals that we put out to listen, to be attentive to feedback from our environment and our relationships. In this way, we can live in ma'at. We can express, we can be creative, we can desire, we can engage our lust and let go in trust. To adjust, to be resilient, to move in homeodynamic fluidity, that is our nature. It all comes back to A.L. Al-Famad, be thyself, step forward in truth, be attentive to feedback, respond in love with respect. Here we activate the art of being true and creative. We serve Ma'at by living in Ma'at. In our lives, we serve Ma'at. We serve each other. We serve ourselves. We serve all of life through our choices and our behavior. In my professional practice as a physician, I work with Sekhmet as the embodiment of self-healing and bring medicine to support that self-healing, to help each person be true to themselves, to be strong, and to be respectful. Living in Ma'at guides life's power. Lori and I practice what we call person-centered collaborative care, using explicitly Ma'atian principles. Two questions I often ask myself and others really relate to the issue of if there's this ideal future, how are we going to get there? What are we waiting for? And my question really, first of all, is how much of this future aeon, this new aeon of Ma'at even, are we already living? Have we already been creating? Is part of our nature and we never stop doing? How do we relate to our family and our friends? How do we treat others we don't know? 
all the practical aspects of everyday life. How do we grow food? How do we sell products to each other? How do we organize and communicate? How do we transport ourselves? Let's look at each day in our current life and recognize how much of that healthy future we have already created in our own lives and in our communities. And that raises the question of how much more of the new and can we create each day in our own lives, in the broader world around us. That's up to us. Ma'at is created each day as it always has been. This is a beautiful image from Sean Woodward called Gaia Self-Healing. It's Sean's representation of a concept I presented to him wherein Gaia externalizes the planet and holds it between her hands and engages in some kind of realignment, some qigong, some reiki, some transmission of self-healing for the planet. This elegant piece of art was created by Laurie Stargrove. It shows the earth with seven children around it, the seven children of Gaia. Ptahotep said, let your life be an example and live justly, for if justice remains a firm foundation, your children will prosper. Arundhati Roy Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. We are Gaia Healing.